Peter, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, and welcome you all to the Gairdner RCIS, RCIS Public Lectures, our joint lecture we hold each year. I want to tell you a little bit about the Gairdner Foundation, those of you who don't know who we are. You can read a little bit on the, on the banner there. The Gairdner Foundation has been founded in 1957 with the foresight of Jim Gairdner, who was a Toronto philanthropist. And he set up the Gairdner Awards. The Gairdner Awards, he wanted to recognize scientists who did great research that was going to have impact on human health. So he really wanted this to be an international award, no boundaries, the very best wherever the science came from. And the first awards were given in 1959, and we've given out over 380 awards since then. And the important thing that you might think about when you think about the Gardner Awards, they're giving awards in biomedical science, in health research, that has impact on human health, but we are picking scientists of huge international stature. And of the over 380 awardees who've had a Gairdner Award, 87 of whom have gone on to receive the Nobel Prize. And in fact, this year, the Nobel Prize winners in medicine, three of them, uh, received the, the uh, Gairdner Award in, in 2012. So we, we not only are good at predicting the Nobel Prize, we like to pride ourselves on being there well before the Nobel gets round to recognizing these people. So we're funded by an endowment from the Gairdner family, but also by the Canadian government and provincial government. So we're very dependent and very lucky to be supported by, government, by a variety of governments. And really, they support us because they see that recognizing science is not just about giving out prizes. It really is using that science and those people who we can attract to Canada to help convene leaders, convene people to drive science forward in Canada, but also to reach out to the public and to students and high school students. So when we give out the awards each year, the laureates that we give prizes to have to understand that that part of doing the prize is to be able to come to Canada, visit centers across the country, meet with students, meet with researchers, and most importantly, meet with the public and high school students and explain what their research is all about and why their research has impact and why indeed science research in general is impacting on all of our lives. So each year we give out se uh, five, uh, sorry, s um, seven uh, international awards, one Global Health Award and one Canada Whiteman Award, which is specifically for a Canadian. The international awards this year went to a variety of people and I'm very happy to say that one of the international awards went to Lewis Kay, which is why he is here to give the Gairdner Lecture today. He received the, the Canada Gairdner International Award uh, for his work from, on the development of modern NMR spectroscopy for studies of biomolecular dynamics. And I will say that he is the 48th Canadian to receive the International Gairdner Award. So we were very, very proud that he was able to compete with people around the world to be recognized for the importance of his research. So Lewis Kay is Professor of Molecular Genetics, Biochemistry and Chemistry at the University of Toronto, right here. He received his BSc in Biochemistry from the University of Alberta uh, and his PhD in Biophysics from Yale University. And then he spent some time as a postdoc at the NIH uh, in Chemical Physics. He joined the faculty ranks here at the University of Toronto in 1992 as an assistant professor. And amazingly, three years later, he skipped the, inter the uh, intervening uh, ranks and was promoted to professor in three years, which demonstrates to you the meteoric rise of his research at that time and ongoing since that time. In fact, in 2012, University of Toronto named him to be university professor which is the very highest rank that is given out to only a few members of the faculty here of the very highest level. Uh, as you'll hear in more detail, his research is really field-defining. It cuts across the, the interface of physical chemistry and medical sciences and has made him a recognized world leader in structural biology. He's received lots and lots of awards and honors. I could go on, but I won't because you want to hear from him. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of London and the Royal Society of Canada. Among the other uh, many awards he's received are the Karana Prize from the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Founders Medal from the International Society of Magnetic Resonance in Biological Systems, the Stacey Prize from the National Research Council of Canada, and the Flavel Medal from the Royal Society of Canada. 
And recently, he was named an officer of the Order of Canada. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's really my personal pride and, and pleasure to welcome Dr. Kay to the stage. Well, thank you very much, Janet, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today, but I have to make a confession. I've uh, never given a general talk before. Usually I give talks to audiences where people know probably more than I do about the subject material. This is a little bit different, but I have given now five lectures to high school students uh, on my uh, general field and what it's like to be a scientist. And so I'm going to close my eyes and Suppose that you're a bunch of prepubescent uh, high school students, and then I think everything will be just fine. So what I want to do today is to tell you my story. Um, it's uh, entitled Making the Invisible Visible, just so a few of you would brave the cold weather and come. But really what I want to describe is a journey that I couldn't have predicted, say, 20 or 15 years ago. Uh, an evolving journey in which we've used the technologies of physics to be able to understand biology and to be able to understand the molecular machines in the cell that are so important for biological function. And since not every one of you has the pleasure of being a biochemist or a biophysicist, I thought that I would start at the beginning and just emphasize some of the overall features, the general features that we have to understand to get an appreciation of uh, what we're trying to do. So the global uh, picture is shown as follows. We have a cell, and inside the cell there's a nucleus, and in the nucleus there's a blueprint for life. And so that's indicated here via the DNA. And I study things that are downstream of the DNA. The DNA encodes for proteins. The proteins are the movers and shakers in the cell. They carry out tremendous the important biological functions, and we want to understand how that occurs. Now, what I show here is a number of beautiful pictures of proteins and protein complexes, but these things are not static. They're moving around, and we want to understand the relationship between their dynamics and their function. Now, why are proteins so important? Well, I list here a number of reasons. Proteins are important constituents of our nails and our hair. They're very important in terms of our muscles. They're cellular messengers. They're able to relay messages between, say, the inside and the outside of cells. They're uh, involved in a defense, in an elaborate defense system that keeps us healthy. They're important uh, components of blood, transporting oxygen where it's needed. They're involved in brain and nervous tissues in the form of ion channels that signal various responses. They're involved in chemical reactions. They allow chemical reactions to occur orders of magnitude faster than otherwise they would occur. And they're basically the construction workers in the cell. They're involved with building up components of the cell and also with taking them down when they're no longer needed. So proteins carry out a broad range of functions. They're incredibly important. And we want to begin to define the general principles that govern uh, protein function. So given the importance of proteins, let's take a look at them in a little bit more detail at the building blocks that actually make up proteins. And so what I have here is a beads on a string representation of a protein. So if we imagine this whole string being a protein and you have these individual beads, these are the constituents of a protein. They're called amino acids. And they come in roughly 20 different flavors. And so the way that these flavors are going to be arranged is going to be important for dictating what the protein does. It's going to be important for dictating the shape of the protein and how that shape evolves as a function of time. Most proteins, as we know them, take on a defined shape which then moves around. But there are instances, actually a remarkably large number of instances of proteins that really don't assume a shape or a well-defined shape but are moving about all the time. And they're actually extremely important in uh, signaling processes and in the uh, evolution of cancers. And so what we want to understand is how these individual beads give rise to the overall structures of the protein and how these structures change 
one from the other to uh, generate function. Let me just show you a gallery of some of the pretty pictures uh, that we now have of uh, protein structures. Again, bearing in mind that these are not static entities, but they're highly dynamic, and I'll have much more to say about that subsequently. I show here the same protein. It's called calmodulin. It's a protein that's involved in muscle. It's a protein that's involved in signaling. And it's made up of these long helical cylindrical elements. And you see these black dots here. That corresponds to various ions that bind to the protein, calcium ions that bind to the protein and give rise to its uh, shape. Now, the shape evolves in time. Calmodulin is a protein that doesn't just act by itself, but interacts with other protein molecules. And when it does so, it changes its shape. So here we have calmodulin in the absence of any receptor. And here we have calmodulin bound to a small peptide. You can see that this structure of calmodulin looks very different than the structure over here. So the peptide receptor is shown in red. And what's happened upon binding is this long cylinder has essentially broken in half to form two orthogonal components. So proteins are very plastic. They respond to interactions with partners, much like we would, for example, if we were to hug somebody. You have calmodulin hugging this red protein and really changing its structure, and that's important for function. You have another very important protein here. This is uh, an antibody, which recognizes foreign material uh, in the body. And it's a highly dynamic entity. It's made up of a handle region, if you like, and then uh, two balloons here. These are responsible for recognizing uh, foreign invaders and uh, attacking them. And there's a lot of dynamics that happen both in this region here and in this region here. It turns out that these uh, molecules here, uh, in certain circumstances, are going to aggregate and form uh, a number of different diseases. We're currently studying the mechanism by which uh, that process happens. So you have molecules that are important in health, but they can also be uh, important in disease as well. And the relationship between the two is often associated with dynamics. You have molecular machines, which is a, a hobby of mine, the study of them. Uh, molecular machines do a variety of different uh, functions in the cell. They can print money, for example. One of the currencies is ATP. It's an energy currency. And you have a giant molecular machine which was responsible for that. You have other molecular machines that are going to steer cells away from danger or towards food, for example. You have giant molecular machines which can read instructions from other molecules and essentially reproduce themselves, generate new proteins that are then used by the cell. You have uh, protein machines that can be used as gates, allowing the entry of various ions into the cell or out from the cell, depending on whether these gates are open and closed. So proteins can assume a variety of different shapes and a variety of different functions. Here's one of my favorite proteins of all time. It's a giant protein, as you can clearly see. It occupies almost the full slide. It's called the proteasome, and this is a garbage can. So this protein is responsible for chewing up other protein molecules when these molecules get damaged or when they're past their prime. And just to uh, illustrate the gigantic size of this uh, garbage can, I show the little baby calmodulin indicated here. So we study small proteins, but we're particularly interested in studying the very big ones because there are real challenges in doing so which require uh, new innovations. So protein molecules are not static, and we can't capture them in a single picture. And what I try to do, along with a team of really outstanding trainees and uh, associates, is understand how the pictures change in time. You might say to yourself, well, why does this matter? And let me try to illustrate that as follows. Suppose you've never seen a baby before. This is your first encounter with a baby. There would be certain conclusions that you would be able to make you would be able to make uh, the assertion that all babies wear at least some uh, aspect of their clothing is green. Also, babies are either always happy or always eating. And when they're eating, they're feeding themselves. That's what you would be able to conclude from these two static pictures. Nothing more, nothing less. But of course, the situation is more complicated than that. Maybe babies can feed themselves, but they 
do so in a rather random way, and they're not always clean, and they're not always wearing green as well. So by these additional pictures of how the baby evolves with time, you get probably a more accurate picture of what's going on. And then we can carry that on further. You can see that babies are not always happy. Sometimes they express themselves in different ways. And so what we really have to do if we want to understand how babies evolve in time is get a whole snapshot of pictures to be able to figure out uh, how uh, babies are able to uh, respond to their environment. Now, just as multiple pictures are needed to understand babies and the activities of babies, the situation is really very similar uh, with protein molecules, and I'd like to illustrate that now. So what I show in red is an enzyme, a protein molecule, and in blue is a small compound that is acted on by the protein molecule. Now the protein molecule changes its shape upon binding to the blue substrate, the blue uh, small compound, and then reacts with it to produce uh, products as indicated here. So there's been a change of shape, there's been dynamics that have occurred that are absolutely essential for biological function. Let me illustrate uh, that in the following way. Now, proteins don't need an excuse to be dynamic. We don't need to involve a substrate or a compound that will then be acted on by the protein. These proteins are dynamic in their own right by themselves all the time. And let me just illustrate that by means of the following video. a little bit of music to make it entertaining. So what I'm going to show you here is a protein. It's made up of about 300 beads on a string. Each bead is uh, one of possibly 20 different amino acids. And you can see that the amino acids have different components to them, indicated by these dots, which are atoms. And they're arranged in these yellow and purple structures, these helices in purple, these strands in, shown here in yellow that form what's called beta sheets. And if we zoom in on the molecule, you can now see the atoms specifically. And the position of the atoms is going to be very important for function. Now, this is what really is going on is the protein molecule in the cell is being bombarded with water, other protein molecules, other large biological molecules as an exchange of energy. That energy is going to be transferred into a particular direction, which then carries out function. But this is how molecules really are going to uh, appear inside a cell. They are not static entities. They are highly dynamic. They are changing their shapes in ways that give rise to function. And what we want to be able to do is to understand, using the tools of physics, what those changes are, how they come about, and most importantly, how they're directed to uh, carry out a particular task. So we want to understand how molecules are able to carry out their function. And we've chosen to use a technology that relates to magnetism to be able to do that. Now, you might say to yourself, of all the different technologies that are out there, why do you want to understand how molecules dance through magnetism? What does magnetism have to do with these biological molecules at all? Now, as scientists, of course, we're all influenced by other people, by other scientists who might say something to us and cause us to uh, go on a different path, for example. And I want to uh, show you one particular scientist that I was influenced by who really convinced me that magnetism is something very important that we should all consider. This scientist is named uh, Dave Barry, and he made this uh, famous quote. He says, magnetism is one of the six fundamental forces of the universe with the other five being gravity, duct tape, whining, remote control, and the force that pulls dogs towards the groins of strangers. <laughs> so you can clearly see that magnetism is off the charts important. And we thought that maybe if Drew says that this is, or Dave, or whatever his name is, says that this is so important, we should somehow spice up our science with magnetism and magnetic fields. And that's, in fact, what we do. And so let me just take you now uh, through a very uh, a brief sojourn uh, dealing with a little bit of the fundamentals of magnetism so that you can understand the experiments that we're going to carry out. Now, magnetism involves magnets. I'll be talking about bar magnets. They have north and south poles. And we all know that north attracts south. A pair of norths or a pair of souths 
are going to repel one another. This is true for macroscopic bar magnets that we all have familiarity with. We all have fridges. We all have magnets that we put on fridges. Well, we deal with magnets as well in my research, but these magnets are going to be microscopic in nature. But they still obey many of the features that the uh, macroscopic magnets do. Now, let me try to schematically illustrate the experiment that we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of money and buy a very, very big magnet. This magnet is going to be very powerful. It's going to be a roughly 500,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, and hopefully it will never reverse its polarity. And then we have this big magnetic field, and we're going to take our samples. Our samples are made up of molecules. These are the molecules that are dancing around, and we want to understand their dance. And the important thing is that these molecules, in fact, any molecule, whether it's a molecule that is important in biology or in chemistry, every molecule has little bar magnets that are associated with it. So these little bar magnets are just like the macroscopic bar magnets that I showed you on a previous slide. They're going to give off tiny little magnetic fields, and they're going to interact with this very expensive bar magnet that I show here that we've spent millions of dollars on. Now, what's going to happen? Well, we know that there's preferred orientations, as I showed you on the previous slide with magnets. We know that a north pole is attracted to a south pole. Two north poles are going to repel. And the same situation happens here, but on a microscopic level, obeying the rules of quantum mechanics. So the rules are a little bit different, but the results are essentially the same, that we take our sample, which is made up of these tiny microscopic bar magnets that obey the laws of quantum mechanics. These atoms that are essentially part of the protein, hydrogens and carbons and nitrogens, they're all little bar magnets. And these bar magnets can orient in two positions. They can either orient with the big magnetic field, indicated here by this arrow going up, so you can think about this as the south pole of the little magnet that's oriented towards the north pole. Or there can be a higher energy state where we have the reverse. North is oriented with north and south is oriented with south. There are fewer of those because that's a higher energy situation. And then what we're going to do in our NMR experiment is we're going to perturb the system. The system is our little tiny bar magnets that are associated with our protein molecules. So how do we go about doing that and why do we want to perturb our system? Well, suppose that you have a punching bag. You have a punching bag, you've had a hard day, you're going to punch the punching bag. So before you punch the punching bag, the punching bag is in what I'll call the equilibrium position. It's upright, and it's waiting for you to do something to it. You apply a punch, that means you put energy into the punching bag, and what happens? The punching bag topples over. And then what happens? Over time, the punching bag is going to come back to the same position that it was before you applied a punch, that is to say, to the equilibrium position. And that's essentially what we do in NMR. You can think about these individual little spins as punching bags. We're going to not only buy, buy a very expensive field, but we're also going to buy electronics that come with it that can apply a variety of different punches. And what I do in my lab is I decide, along with my team, how we want to administer these punches how long we want to wait between punches, what angle we want to apply the punch punches, how strong the punches should be. And that will change the response of these little bar magnets to our punches. And we're going to follow that response over time. And that response is going to give us detailed information about molecular structure and about molecular dynamics, how the structure changes with time. So that's the basic experiment. Let me just illustrate that in a little bit more scientific terms. What we have here is the low energy situation. So we have a north and a south pole that we spend millions of dollars to generate. And then we have our sample, our NMR sample, because the technique that I used is called NMR. It's like MRI, but we don't take pictures of bones and joints, but rather of little molecules. So the NMR gives us a picture and these are the little bar magnets. There's roughly 10 to the 17th of them in a sample. So there's a lot of little bar magnets in the sample. And the most majority of them are going to be associated with the big bar magnet in the following way. Red is south. So south of the little microscopic invisible bar magnet is associated with north, north with south. 
Then we add energy to the system, and that inverts the bar magnet, and we now have this situation, which is a high energy situation. It's an unstable situation, and it will go back to this situation shown here that will require energy to be emitted, and we're going to detect that energy because that energy is very sensitive to the bar magnet of the position of the bar magnet in relation to the whole uh, protein structure. So schematically what we have is as follows. Here's a sample tube and here's the liquid. And the liquid contains 10 to the 17th molecules that we want to study. So these are essentially identical copies of the molecule. We can look also at cells, which have, of course, many different molecules. We can look at solutions that might have two or three different molecules that interact because we want to understand how molecules interact with each other as well. And then we're going to take this sample and we're going to put it in a giant magnetic field. That's shown here by this can. It's roughly 500,000 times the magnetic field of the Earth. And then behind the can, you can see these cabinets here. Inside the cabinets are going to be electronic devices that are the punches that we apply to the little bar magnets to get them to do all sorts of things to reveal themselves in terms of their, the structure and the uh, dynamics of the molecules that they comprise. At the end of the day, we get what we call spectra. These are pieces of paper, if you like. We don't really deal with pieces of paper anymore. When I was a young scientist, we did, but now we have computers. So this would be in the computer, and we would have various spots. You can see that there are various spots. There's one spot for every bead on the string that we're studying in this particular class of experiment. And we can do a whole bunch of different experiments that allow us to look at every bead to be able to get out detailed structural information. And then from a whole bunch of different experiments, each which give us dots arranged in various ways, we can generate a three-dimensional picture of the molecule and how that molecule changes with time. So this is called a spectrum, and it's a map. It's a map of the energies of each bar magnet in the protein. And remember that every carbon, proton, and nitrogen Every carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen is a bar magnet and therefore available to us to study. So these are little spies, magnetic spies of structure and dynamics. Over the years, we and others have developed various experiments that allow us to determine to high resolution, that is to say with clarity, what the pictures of these biological molecules are. But what really excites me is work that is aimed at understanding how the pictures change with time, which I call dynamics. But there was a dark cloud that emerged on my field many years ago, actually. And the problem is that the NMR signals, the signals, so we have a punching bag, we punch, and then we determine the response of that punching bag to our punches. That response disappears very quickly, and it disappears even more quickly quickly as we deal with molecules of increasing complexity. Now, I've told you that the molecules of the cell are big. These are big protein molecules. And we want to study molecular machines that are even bigger. And the problem is that those molecular machines give rise to signals, the signals decay so rapidly that we have no time to carry out the measurements. And so now what we're going to have to do is if we want to advance our understanding of the biochemistry and biology, we're going to have to go back to physics and develop the tools which will allow us to then address the questions we're interested in addressing. So let me just illustrate that in the following manner. So let's look at three different proteins with different sizes. So here you have a baby protein. It's made up of roughly 70 beads. So that would be a very small protein as far as biology is concerned. A typical protein for biology has roughly 400 or 500 beads on the string. This one is big. It's made up of roughly 700 beads. So that would be bigger than the average human protein. But this is gigantous. It's an order of magnitude bigger than this, which is already big. So how do we go about studying something that is so big like this, where the signals are disappearing very quickly? Now, I have to be honest. What interested me about this question was not the biology. I wasn't trained as a biologist. What really excited me about this question was the physics. How do you 
essentially defeat the inherent physics, which says that the signal is going to decay away very quickly. It was only later on, once we had achieved that, that I, we realized that we could now begin to study really important biological systems. So what motivated us initially was the physics. So let me explain how we go about doing that, and I'll do so in the following way. What I show here is a structure of a small protein, roughly 100 beads. These white balls correspond to the hydrogens in the protein. Now, every protein has lots of hydrogens. They're naturally there. And these hydrogens are little bar magnets that give off signals. So in fact, we're in luck because we have a lot of signals that we can use to get our information about structure and dynamics. But as we go to larger and larger si systems, having too many signals is, in fact, a bad situation. Let me illustrate that in the context. Suppose that we wanted to look at the signal from this bar magnet here. By virtue of its proximity to other bar magnets, remember these bar magnets are giving off magnetic fields, what these magnetic fields are going to do is they're going to interact with the signal because the signal gives off magnetic fields as well. So all of these magnetic fields are going to interact with one another. Just like all, if you bring into contact a bunch of different bar magnets, they're going to interact with one another. And what happens is the signals that emanate, the little magnetic fields that emanate from the surrounding bar magnets are going to interact with the signal of interest in such a way that they're going to restore the signal of interest back to its equilibrium position. And in NMR, in the technology that we use, the equilibrium position is no signal. And that restoration becomes more and more efficient as a function of the increased molecular weight of the systems that we're dealing with. So as we go to the molecular machines of the cell, the signals that we want to detect, which will provide us with the information about the structure and the dynamics, are going to be dissipated very quickly. There's a lot of friction, if you like. We're going to lose those signals because they're going to, the, the uh, information goes back to the equilibrium no signal position. And so what we decided to do many years ago now was to get rid of many of these white balls. If these white balls are little magnetic fields, and if these magnetic fields are causing the signal of interest, to be lost very rapidly, simply get rid of these white balls. Get rid of the protons in the protein. Now, one can, in fact, do that. We can substitute hydrogen 1 for hydrogen 2. So we can substitute these protons for deuterons, a different sort of hydrogen that essentially involve a bar magnet that is much more tiny than these protons. So we can replace these white balls with essentially invisible balls, which will allow the remaining balls that we have that are used for detection of the information to be of much higher sensitivity. And so what we're going to do is as follows. We're going to construct proteins in the following way. We're going to get rid of the white balls, and we're going to replace them with magenta balls. These magenta balls correspond to methyl groups. You may remember from perhaps many years ago that methyl groups are a carbon and three hydrogens that are attached. The three hydrogens attached to a carbon. And it turns out that many of the beads of a protein contain these methyl groups. They are there naturally. And we can label the protein of interest with little bar magnets that are associated with these methyl groups. For example, the methyl groups have three protons. We have bar magnets. We can deal with carbon that is a particularly a uh, ty particular type of isotope called C13, which is also a bar magnet. And we can label our proteins, therefore, that we only have C13 bar magnets and hydrogen bar magnets in the methyl groups, no other place. So we get rid of most of the white balls. We lose, therefore, the forces that would restore the signal back to the equilibrium position, which is no signal. Now, how does one go about doing that? Well, nowadays, it's very easy. One can simply purchase the uh, precursors that are necessary for growing up proteins in the designed way. Back in the day, say 20 years ago, we approached a number of different companies, and we said, well, we have this wonderful idea. You're going to be able to make lots of money from it. We just need you to produce the compounds for us, and we'll demonstrate that idea. And they said, you produce the compounds, demonstrate the idea, and then if there's money to be made, we'll make it. And so what we had to do is we had to purchase other compounds. We had to generate the enzymes that would allow us to biosynthetically change the compounds that were commercially available into the compounds that we needed 
to then label our protein molecules appropriately. These were the compounds that we produced that you can now buy. And when you add these compounds to a factory of cells, which essentially produce the system, the protein that you want, where you only have bar magnets associated with the methyl groups, but in no other positions, you can then generate uh, the uh, molecules to study. And so these are a couple of the precursors that we feed to E. coli cells. E. coli cells produce the proteins. So we're using uh, the technology, genetic uh, 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 engineering technology that allows us to produce high quantities of the protein that we need for biophysical studies. And what you get looks very similar to what I showed you before. This is a spectrum where every one of these dots corresponds to a methyl group, to a carbon and three hydrogens associated with a particular amino acid. And what we have to do as spectroscopists, we have to determine what each of these dots, where it comes from in the structure, in our protein. For example, this dot here is from isoleucine 12. Isoleucine is a particular type of amino acid, a particular bead that has a methyl group. And this is the peak from isoleucine 12. There's a peak from isoleucine 147 and so forth. And if we know the origin of each of these peaks, then we have, if you like, a readout of the dynamics and the structure at the level of these methyl positions in the protein. So that's, that's our goal. We produce proteins that are labeled in a given way, and then we determine what the origin of the signals are, which allow us really an ent entree into the structure so that we can learn something about it. Now, you have to go beyond that. We have our molecules, but we have to design the physics that is particularly well suited for the labeling scheme that we have. Now remember, the probes that we're going to use are going to be methyl groups, a carbon and three hydrogen. These methyl groups are going to be parts of the uh, amino acids, the beads on the string uh, that we want to study. And we have to pay attention to the underlying physics. If we forget about the physics for a moment and do a typical NMR experiment, and now I'm not showing you a two-dimensional map, but rather a one-dimensional representation. So this would be the response of a given uh, methyl group. So this is a signal. It's a one-dimensional signal that we get out of our instrument. As a function, if you like, of the size of the molecule to which the methyl group is attached. Now remember, we're dealing with very, very big molecules, these are molecular machines. So if we have a small molecule, for example, we get a nice signal. You can see this blue thing is a signal, a nice peak. We can easily see it. But as we go to larger and larger molecules, molecular machines, the signal becomes very fat, and it essentially melts away into the noise. This black bar is supposed to indicate the noise in our observation. So as we study larger and larger systems, we encounter a problem unless we think more deeply about it. And so we developed an experiment that takes advantage of the fact that we're dealing with four bar magnets, a carbon and three hydrogens. These bar magnets are going to give off magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields, as we know, are going to add and subtract from each other. Now it stands to reason that there's going to be some of those bar magnets where the magnetic fields completely subtract out. Remember, these magnetic fields are going to serve as forces that are going to take the signal of interest and restore it back to the equilibrium position. And the equilibrium position in what I do is no signal. So we don't want those neighboring magnetic fields. And so if we can select the signals that emerge from methyl groups where all of the magnetic fields are going to cancel out, we can generate signals that are going to last for much longer periods of time we essentially immortalize the signals even as we apply our technology to larger and larger systems. So rather than have the signal dissipate here, we could have a situation here where we still have a lot of signal for very high molecular weight systems. And let me just describe one application of where this technology has proven to be useful in trying to understand a situation that is related to health. I want to talk about one molecular machine. So this is my rendition of what a cell should look like. It's not accurate at all, but it's what a biophysicist might think about a cell uh, uh, 
might visual, how a biophysicist might visualize a cell. Notice that I put the proteasome, that's the giant garbage can, right in the middle of the cell. That's because it's one of my favorite molecules. And what I want to, the story that I want to tell you about today is not about the proteasome specifically, but rather about this red molecule here, which is called P97. It's a molecular machine. It interacts with the proteasome because what it does is it takes molecules, protein molecules that are past their prime or that are damaged somehow, and it brings them, it escorts them to the proteasome. That's the giant garbage can where the uh, proteins in question are going to be degraded. Okay, so P97 is going to take proteins that it would otherwise clump up in the cell and prevent it from functioning to the garbage can where they're going to be eliminated. P97 does a whole bunch of other things as well. It's involved in the reorganization of membranes, various organelles in the cell. It's involved in uh, DNA damage repair, for example. When your DNA gets damaged, and all of our DNA at some stage does get damaged, of course, it has to be repaired. DNA is the blueprint. It's the, they're the instructions for, for these proteins. They have to be correct. If they're not corrected, if there's damage, of course, it can lead to a whole bunch of different diseases, including cancer. So what happens is we have a, an elaborate uh, repair mechanism, but once the repair has happened, P97 gets involved and pulls the complex that does the repair apart. The DNA is already repaired. You have to break up the complex. And the various constituents of the complex are then going to be uh, shoved into the garbage can for degradation. P97 also takes various membrane-bound proteins, removes them from the membrane if they're damaged, and brings them to the proteasome as well. And P97 is also involved in degradation of proteins using non-proteasomal or non-garbage can approaches involving an organelle in the cell called the lysosome. And it's this pathway that P97 plays an important role. It transports proteins to the lysosome for degradation. This pathway is going to be interfered with in a number of different diseases, and I want to tell you a little bit about that today. So let me just illustrate, in terms of beautiful static pictures, what the P97 molecule actually looks like. The P97 molecule sort of looks like two donuts. You have a top donut and a bottom donut, and these donuts are six-fold symmetric. They're made up of six units. Each unit is 806 beads. And each unit has what we call domains or various areas. There's an N-terminal domain in blue, and then there's a couple of other domains. Together, they form the donuts. There's the red donut formed by this domain and the white donut formed by this domain. When one gets six of these together and six of these together, that's what you get. And you can see that the blue domain, which I'll refer to as hands, are coplanar with the donut in this particular picture. They're at the sides of this donut. Now, this picture was taken when the red and the white domains were bound to ADP. Remember I said that one of the energy currencies in the cell is called ATP. ATP has energy that the cell use, uses to carry out biological functions. ADP is when, what you get when you've already spent the energy. So this molecule uses the energy of ATP to carry out its functions. It takes energy to carry out functions. That energy is in the form of ATP. Once the ATP gets broken up or hydrolyzed, it becomes what we call ADP. And this is the picture in the ADP form, shown also here. The hands are on the side. In the ATP form, the hands are above the plane of the molecule. Okay, these hands are going to grasp on to various other molecules to carry out functions. And I'm just going to denote that in this cartoon uh, representation. We have the down form. That's when the currency is spent, when you've spent your energy, ADP. The hand, which is in blue, corresponding to this region here, which we call NTD, is going to be down. Or in the ATP form, before you go on your shopping spree, the hand is going to be up. Now remember, there are six of these entities that are connected to form this molecular machine. It's called 
hexameric, and there's going to be a hand associated with each one of them, but I'm only going to draw one hand. If we rotate the molecule by 90 degrees, you can clearly see the beautiful six-fold symmetry. This is one of the attractions of structural biology. These molecules are just so beautiful, but they're not static at all, and so this picture is misleading. Now, it's believed that these hands are really important. These hands are going to grip on to various other molecules. P97 carries out so many different functions in the cell. How is it that it knows what it's supposed to be doing? Well, P97 has secretaries that organize it properly. There's roughly 40 different secretaries, 40 different adapter molecules. Many are molecular machines as well. And the blue hands interact with these adapter molecules. The blue hands also interact with other molecules, so-called substrates, that are then acted on by P97 in processes that depend on energy, namely on the ATP, high energy, going to ADP, low energy. And this process is accompanied by a down or an up to down uh, change in the position of the hands. So it's thought to be very uh, important. Now, not surprisingly, P97 is implicated in a variety of different diseases, including cancer and neurodegeneration. And what I show again, if we focus on the beautiful six-fold structure and on the region indicated here by this uh, rectangle, and then zoom up the rectangle, so we have a blue hand here, and then in between the blue hand and the red body of the structure, we have these yellow beads. Any one of these beads, any one of these yellow amino acids, when they're mutated, so one out of 806 beads, if it's incorrect, can cause disease that leads to death. And those diseases are associated with this pathway here, which is, again, a degradation pathway when protein molecules no longer can carry out their function. They've got to be destroyed. This is one of the pathways by which it happens. And these changes in the uh, types of beads give rise to a variety of different diseases that are associated with dementia, that are associated with uh, musculature problems, and that are also associated with problems with bones. Now, there's a large number of beautiful structures. And the point that I want to illustrate here is that, well, a picture may be worth a thousand words. It's not worth a million words. Let me explain to you what I mean. What I show here is in the high energy state of the molecule. You can see that the arms, these, they're not blue anymore, but the arms are going to be above the donut. This is true for the wild type protein. That's the normal protein when you don't have a disease. It's also the case for these mutated proteins as well. These mutated proteins look just like the normal protein in the ATP form. Can't tell the difference, even if you look with exquisite detail. In the same way, after we've spent the energy, if we look at the wild type protein and various disease proteins, they look very similar as well. So we don't get any information about what the molecular origin of the disease is from these very high resolution albeit static structures. And so that's when we decided uh, we would get involved. And so remember that what we're going to do in our experiments is we're going to take P97. We have labeling schemes. We have the appropriate physics that allows us to look at these gigantic molecular machines. We're going to focus on methyl groups. So that's a carbon and three hydrogens. And a number of the beads have these methyl groups. They're endogenous. And we're going to look at an amino acid at a bead called isoleucine, one of the 20 different flavors of the beads, in particular isoleucine 189, position 189. That's a very good position that reports on the state of the arms or the hands, whether they're up or down. And so we record NMR spectra. Remember, these spectra are these pages that we get which have little balls on them, little peaks on them, if you like. So this is the peak that we get in red that corresponds to our molecule in the non-diseased form, in the healthy form, in the ADP form, the low energy form. So that's when the hands are down. This is what we get way up here for the same molecule, the wild type molecule, the healthy molecule in the ATP form, in the high energy form. And what I show with all these different colors are the positions of this residue 
in different disease samples in the ADP form. Now, from the beautiful static structures, we know that the ADP form is supposed to be hands down. But in fact, from the NMR experiments that we can measure, that's not at all the case. These are various disease mutants that are supposed to be right here where the red peak is, but clearly are not. And in fact, what's very interesting is that yellow is just a little bit of disease, green a little bit more disease, pink here, very significant disease. So as a function of increasing disease severity, hands that are supposed to be on the side begin to go up. And so what's happened is a situation where the up-down, what we call equilibrium, the energetics between the down hands state and the up states is all messed up. And since that energetics is very important for biological function, it's not surprising that the function is also messed up. Now one of the nice things that we can get just by looking at this data right away is we can determine what the equilibrium is between down and up. How many downs we have versus how many ups because the position of these peaks gives us that information right away. So just to uh, illustrate that again, what we have in the low energy state, the hands are supposed to be in the down position, but as a function of disease, mutant severity, the hands go in the up position. Now, again, P97, the molecule that we're studying, is involved in a bunch of processes, and we're focusing on disease mutants, which cause havoc with the degradation of proteins via the lysosomal uh, pathway. Remember also that P97 has to be told what to do. That involves various different adapter molecules, various different secretaries that essentially say to P97, hey, you're supposed to be doing something with the lysosome, lysosome right now. And the uh, molecule that carries that out, the so-called adapter molecule, is shown here. So this molecule is going to bind to P97, our molecular machine, and tell it, hey, you've got to be doing a particular function. And we've been able to determine by NMR that there are two important regions, two hot spots on the adapter molecule, which tells P97 what to do. There's a yellow hot spot, which binds to this blue here. And then there's a triangular wedge, which interacts in between the blue and the base of the enzyme. So that we can establish by NMR. And moreover, what we can do is we can determine where those interactions are on the structure, and that's I've indicated here. So again, if we look at the hexameric structure of our molecule, focusing on this region here, which I've blown up, in yellow is the region of the hand that interacts with the adapter molecule, the yellow region here. And in this red here is the region of the P97 molecule that interacts with this wedge here of the adapter. Now remember these disease mutants, what do they do? They cause the blue hand to be removed from the pink area here. So if the blue is removed from the pink, there's no longer an interface that this wedge can bind to. Bind to. So that is, we think, one of the uh, reasons why function is impaired. And so we've done experiments as a function of increasing disease severity for a normal protein that's wild type, that is not diseased, healthy. We get an interaction between P97 and this so-called adapter molecule, which is the first step towards directing it in a particular manner. And this interaction is shown here schematically. As we begin to study disease mutants, the wedge can no longer fit in properly because the blue ball has been removed from the gray interface. And finally, very severe disease mutants are such where the blue ball is raised up to the point where this red hedge can no longer uh, interact with the structure. And we think that that's responsible, at least to some extent, for disease. Now, we can carry out experiments, perhaps, to revert disease. Could we come up with an experiment? Remember, we're talking about our molecules. Our molecules are made up of 800 little amino acids. One amino acid is enough for causing disease. Can we find another bead that if we change its nature, its flavor, we can perhaps revert the disease mutant and make a normal molecule? 
And so we set aside our goal to be take a disease mutant that is very severe and turn it into a molecule which is completely functional. Let me show you an example of that. This is a mutation where a particular bead called R is mutated to a bead called C. Now again, I want to show you a region of a spectrum where we're going to focus on a methyl group. It's the same one, 189, which is a reporter of the down or up positions of the uh, hands. This red peak here corresponds to the down position in the low energy state, the ADP state, for the normal wild type protein. Here is the up position for the normal high energy state, ATP. And this is the disease mutant. So what that means is that the blue hands are going to be in between up and down. And it turns out that if we look at a, just a single mutant at a position close by, we can change this blue peak into the orange peak down here. So we can revert the hands from being up like this, where they really should be down, into the down position. And we can restore activity, at least as assayed through binding of various adaptive molecules. So it gives hope, perhaps, that we can exploit the inherent flexibility and plasticity of the system to develop ways by which we can revert disease proteins back to normal functional states. Now, our interest in molecular machines and in the development of both physics and labeled for, uh, labels for our experiments has led to unexpected sort of non-scientific results, if you like. For example, a multi-million dollar a year industry. This is not something that we anticipated. This is not something that we wanted. And I can assure you that we don't receive a penny uh, associated with uh, the uh, labeling schemes that we've developed, but there's a number of companies which now sells them. So it's an example of a spin-off. You want to be able to answer a specific question, but in the process of doing that, uh, you uh, can achieve uh, other goals, at least for, for other people. Uh, also, some of our work dealing with garbage cans, namely the proteasome, has led to ways that we can manipulate their functions. Uh, in collaboration with Aaron Schimmer, who is a uh, clinician scientist here in the city, uh, Aaron was studying a molecule called chloroquine, shown here as an anti-cancer. So if you can target the proteasome, you can uh, affect certain classes of cancer. And what Aaron wanted to know is where this drug actually binds onto the garbage can and how it actually does its thing. And so what we did, because we had the technology to looking at these big molecular machines, is shown here. So what I show is the garbage can, and I'm focusing now on just a particular region of the garbage can, illustrated here in gray. I'm going to blow it up here, and what I want to do is focus your attention on this yellow ball here. This is the business end of the molecule. This is the business end of the uh, proteasome molecule where the substrates, the proteins that are damaged are going to get chopped up. It turns out we were able to figure out that this drug is going to bind here a long way away from the position of activity of this particular molecule, of this particular enzyme, and essentially regulate function at a distance. You can imagine that if there are various different types of drugs, one which operates here and one which operates at the business end of the molecules, then you'll be able to regulate the function of the garbage can in a manner which is preferred than just having a single drug because it will be more difficult to build up resistance if you have a multiple drug combination than a single drug. And this has been uh, in clinical trials for a while. Now, this research is rather basic. But as I've shown you in a very, very small scale, it does lead to some commercial uh, relevance. The question is, how does one go about supporting basic research? I mean, basic research requires support. Support is in the form of dollars. And let me just try to indicate and put into perspective uh, what that means. Uh, we've recently uh, had a, a report that's been uh, published where it asks for roughly $1 billion in extra funds distributed over four years. Now, $1 billion may sound like a lot of money to most of you unless you happen to, I don't know, be a baseball player or a basketball player. But just to sort of put things into perspective, I had my son uh, draw a map of Toronto, and this little red rectangle here corresponds to a region 
where the, um, where the price of homes in aggregate would be about a half a billion dollars. So that's the real estate equivalent of what is, one is asking for uh, in terms of extra funds distributed over four years. So put in that context, and in the potential benefits that it could be rather significant, it's really fairly small. Another way of looking at it is as follows. A half a billion dollars corresponds to six of these flying machines, and Canada has 140 of them. Now, I'm not questioning that we need to have these supersonic flying machines. I'm just saying that we also need to ensure that we have a healthy society to take advantage of them, uh, which is important. So surely our, committed, our uh, commitment to keeping our skies as uh, safe as they can be should not exceed our commitment to eliminating suffering, advancing discoveries that can slow aging, neurodegeneration, improve the quality of life through technology. Now, basic research of the sort that I've described today is relatively slow. We don't really know where we're going. We simply do an experiment that looks interesting. We follow our intuition, our curiosity, which leads to another experiment. Fifteen years ago, when we were developing the underlying physics that allows us to look at these important biological molecules, I had no idea that these molecules even existed. So the fact is that basic research takes you in different directions that you can't predict. You have to be allowed to do the basic research. You have to be funded at a level which allows you to develop the technology, to develop what you're interested in, and ultimately it will take you in directions that you couldn't have predicted. And basic research works. I've shown you that in a very small scale with my research. There are, of course, many more outstanding examples of that uh, in the literature. For example, imagine a world where the polio vaccine or the transistor, which you each, each and every one of you has in your smartphones and in your computers, had been delayed by just 10 years. Think of the misery or the lost revenue. In addition to reducing human misery, our investment in a healthy and diversified portfolio of fundamental research and all scientists will more than repay its cost. We may not be aware of what we will lose if we do not contribute adequately, but lose we surely will. And this, these are the words of somebody far smarter than me, a Nobel Prize winner who won the Nobel Prize for superconductivity. And incidentally, just to sort of bring things all together, his Nobel Prize for superconductivity forms the basis for the magnets which we use to study uh, problems of biological interest. So it's all related. It's all fascinating. We don't know where we're going, but we do know that with the collective total of really brilliant people out there who are doing the science, we will be able to achieve some remarkable things. On that note, I will stop and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we've got time for some questions. Um, hands up for a question. Here we go. <laughs> Right, so there are various adapters that bind stronger to a hands-up position. So not having, changing the equilibrium to the hands-down position is going to cause problems. First of all, you're not going to get adapters binding, the adapter binding properly that is responsible for these disease mut mutants. Also, other adapters can be affected as well. They're not affected nearly as much. For example, these mutations affect a certain give rise to a certain disease that is affected by a certain region of the cell, namely the, the lysosomal degradation. Other adapter molecules can still bind, but they may in fact bind too tightly because the equilibrium has been skewed. And so there's not only a misbalance with the particular adapter that is responsible for the biological process, which is now miscued and therefore gives rise to disease, but potentially also other adapters. Right, so typically what we look at 
uh, are really purified components of the cell. So it would be great if we could just take a cell, many cells, and actually study the molecules in their completely native environment. Uh, that would be the ultimate goal, and I should say that there is some progress towards being able to do that by NMR now. People have published papers where they've looked at what they call in-cell NMR, and they look at particular proteins that are specifically distinguishable from all the other molecules in the cell. So they're able to add certain labels in ways that distinguish them. We have not done that. Our molecules are plenty challenging enough, given that they're so big, that we've taken a semi-reductionist approach, if you like. We still study the huge molecules that uh, even, you know, 10 years ago wouldn't have been possible. But we study them in the context of uh, their purified uh, states. And then we add back into the milieu other molecules that would interact with these purified molecules to try to understand the nature of the interactions. But as you mentioned, the situation is so complicated. There's a myriad of molecules, myriad of interactions, the only way that we can actually dissect things out to be able to get really microscopic information, in fact, information at the level of an individual, uh, you know, atomic interaction is through this pseudo-reductionist approach whereby we prepare highly purified systems. We then go back and we test our results in, well, we try to, uh, in the form of uh, looking at mutated proteins or whatever in the context of cells. So, um, one tries to do biological experiments to confirm the results that we obtain biophysically in vitro. We try to do in vivo experiments. Um, that's obviously a very important component to make sure that what you're doing is not just cute biophysics, but is also, you know, relevant. Uh, and we try to do that as best we can. Uh, my son's going to ask me a question now. <laughs> Right, so once you decide, so, so the problem, you know, drug discovery to a large extent is based on trial and error and, and without really understanding at the atomic level what's going on. So these molecules interact with other molecules when those interactions are, are destroyed or weakened or strengthened in, in unnatural ways, one can get problems. So you have to, so the logic goes, you have to really understand those interaction at an atomistic level. Now, if we know that there are certain interactions that are really important that are uh, interfered with in a disease process, then we can give that information to a medicinal chemist, or we can give that information to a, a, a computational chemist. And they can, rather than focus on the huge, big molecule, they can now focus on the region that we've told them is important. So presumably, we can speed up the drug discovery process by many orders of magnitude. That is what one hopes to do by rational drug design. Of course, we are still in the early days because we're trying to learn the rules of the game. And for every molecule, the rules of the game are likely to be quite different. But it's very clear that even if we can speed up the process of drug discovery by a year or two, the implications can be very significant. So can I do that? Uh, no. But can people like David Baker and, and, and others do that? That's you know, one of the things that people are trying to do. We, the problem is that the underlying physics is, is complicated. I think we understand much of that well enough. But there's just such a large number of permutations that are possible, giving the large number of beads and the exponential number of interactions, that it's not a simple problem. Having said that, there's been remarkable advances in the area, and for roughly uh, proteins that are comprised of, say, 200 beads or less, and for many situations, one can do very well. And because we have databases of so many different structures, so that we don't have to do, you know, sort of de novo uh, analyses, we can use the structural information that's already available. Uh, we can uh, expedite uh, the process because we can prevent certain uh, searches that would lead to uh, non-productive results because we know that, say, bead one has to be close to bead 50. 
That's some, something that we can actually get from, sorry? We can test our models easily and we can also put that information inside the computer. And in fact, uh, if I was giving another talk, uh, I would have shown you just how we do that, where we have a little bit of uh, actual hard data, but we have uh, the history of uh, hundreds of thousands of structures out there, so we know on average what's supposed to happen. And we can put that together with the data that we generate, as others have uh, shown uh, as well, to be able to get models that are fairly representative, representative of, of what these structures actually look like. Now, what's more difficult is that these structures, again, are not static, they are dynamic, and capturing the dynamics and understanding not only the code, you know, these 20 different beads, they're arranged in a different order that gives rise to a three-dimensional fold, but also must code for function, most specifically, and therefore for how the three-dimensional structure changes with time. So understanding both the structure and the dynamics and how it's coded in is something that a great number of people are working on because that would sort of give you the holy grail of structural biology. You would be able to allow the computer, uh, and computers work all the time, uh, to essentially give you an answer that then would allow you to branch out and ask specific questions and test the answer in various ways. And that's happening now, for sure. And in fact, I showed you just a little example of that. When we have six repeats of 800 beads, a single bead of the 800 is mutated that gives rise to disease. We've made a designer protein where an additional bead has been changed, which causes the molecule to behave normally and the hands to go back down when they're supposed to be down. Oh, that goes way back, and that's actually an, an interesting story. Well, so your question is a little bit different than who got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> right, that's why I say. So, so, so there, the, the, there was a, right, so there's a, there's a Russian group that, that did some of the pioneering work, absolutely. And then there were groups at Harvard and Stanford that also did some of the pioneering work, and those latter two groups shared the Nobel Prize. This happened in the early 50s. Pardon? No, after. I mean, what, the World War II provided the impetus for it. It provided the impetus for it because you had all of this radar stuff and you, know, and you had a bunch of really smart physicists after the war who were wondering what they're going to do now. So. Sorry? Oh, there are a lot of them. But I, I don't. There's a. The phenomenon of nuclear magnetic resonance, um, if you, you know, according to the textbooks, you will find um, that there's probably three or four people, three or four groups who are. Who, who, uh, there's Purcell, Purcell from Harvard. It was a group also at Stanford who did the same thing. There was the Russian group that you mentioned who probably should have also shared the Nobel Prize. But you know, these, these physicists were very disappointed when they, saw, when they saw the signals. What the physicists really wanted to do was to get fundamental physical constants. And as I've shown you, in the, we get spectra. The physicists, to get a fundamental con uh, physical con constant, what they really needed was just one peak. You know, if you have 50 different peaks, that's a little bit different energies. Well, which one do you take to get the constant, right? So the physicists were very disappointed. The chemists couldn't have been happier because they realized that this is a gold mine. But the chemists didn't realize the biological implications. So who really is responsible for all of this? I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, and it continues on to this very day. I mean, the physicists started it off. They did a lot of the, you know, it's all in the, if you want, everything's, you know, written in a, a few equations. But till we actually understand those equations and the ramifications and the applications, that continues to this very day. 
Magnetic resonance imaging is another example. Also a controversial example in terms of Nobel Prizes, but there too, you know, um, people didn't believe you would be able to image the human body. Uh, and um, that was very distinct than the, 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 the initial experiments that were either done on water, bulk water, or on parafilm. So you have, uh, you know, super high concentrations, you know, hundreds of molar concentrations, and now we're working with concentration of water, which is a tiny molecule, and now we're working with something that has a molecular weight of a megadalton, and uh, we're dealing with concentrations that are a few micromolar. So I think... Absolutely. Absolutely. EPR is also very useful. I think we're going to call this to a uh, close here. I think we're... Okay. Well, he didn't get the Nobel Peace Prize. He got the Nobel Prize in Physics. You know, I, I don't remember. I, I, you can probably... Yeah. And, and what the theory of superconductivity is, I think he would be better able to describe it than I. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, I, I, on behalf of all of us here, I think... Tremendous use of graphics and, 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 and explaining to us what you're what you're doing it and reminding us all of the importance of fundamental research and, and I think that is a, that's a theme that I think you know that thank you to your son for that uh, you know, illustration of uh, of the of this relatively small amount of money that we're looking for for the, the work that we need to have done so with that I'd like to uh, be half of uh, the character in our CI division with a small token of appreciation and thank, thank you very much. much. And thank you very much.